Uh, Jesus is planning to give humans great power over the nations at his return to planet Earth. In Revelation 2.26, He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. In Revelation 3.21, it says, Jesus promises his faithful overcomers a ruling power position. Right? We, we look around the world, we see powerful rulers, we see Putin in Russia, we see uh, Chi in, in China, we see different people around the world exerting power over their nation and wanting to exert power over other nations. Um, when Jesus comes back, um, nations will be under the power of the God family, and we will be in the God family, so it's like we'll, we'll have power. And one power we know is if the Egyptians don't come to the Feast of Tabernacles, then they'll have no rain for a year. That's, that's weather power. That's climate change, I guess, <laughs> especially for Egypt. Um, in verse 21 of Revelation 3, to him who overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me on my throne, as I've also overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. So the greatest throne in the universe is the father's throne. Jesus sitting there with his father right now. And he said, I overcame and that happened. And if you overcome, you'll sit with me in my throne. So you'll have power along with Jesus to guide, you know, people, planet Earth to prevent wars, right? And uh, it's like, if, if we just had that one power now to prevent war, how, how great would that be? We could do that, but we have to wait for Jesus to come back and make it, make it stick. Jesus also shows how faithful humans will be given future kingship positions. And, you know, none of us, none of us have ever been a king, except maybe some husbands in their family. <laughs> yeah. So that's a joke, you can laugh at that. <laughs> um, anyhow, Revelation 1.5, from Jesus Christ, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. So, so kings and kings rule over cities, kings rule over nations, and, and priests are the teachers, the teachers of the law of God. And we have been learning the law of God. We come to Sabbath, we learn more about the law of God. We, <clears throat> we understand more deeply, hopefully, as, as day and weeks go by. Again, in chapter 5, Revelation 5.10, has made us kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. <clears throat> Which is another reason why we're not going to heaven when we die. We, we're going to be down here on earth reigning and helping people live good, good, solid citizen lives. Some kings will be given rulership over many cities. <coughs> Luke 19, 17 shows one particular person got 10, uh, ten cities. In Luke 19, 19, we see where someone <coughs> is given five cities, and that's all Jesus had to say on that subject, but it gives you, you know, it gives you a, you know, it can be as many as ten, maybe it'll be more. Um, it could be five cities, you know, or you, it, maybe it's one city. But <clears throat> any kind of, you know, if you have one city full of people, uh, you've got your hands full because those people want to do what those people want to do and <clears throat> you want them to live godly. So you just got to nudge them in the right direction in, in, in a nice, friendly way if need be, if possible. And in, in other ways, uh, like no rain, <laughs> that's, that's more than a nudge. That's, that's a pretty bad penalty. No rain for a year. I, <clears throat> I don't, I've had hot summers in Texas, but never have we gone no rain for eight months, nine months, 10 months, 11 months, a year. Uh, you know. So then we would be praying for rain, wouldn't we? God wants to train humans now to take on great responsibilities for guiding lives of future humans, yet unborn, many humans, and those who live through the tribulation uh, into the next 1,000 years, which is a pretty big responsibility, but we, have we, are, we are overcoming, and we will have overcome, and we will be leadership people showing other people that they too can overcome. In Acts 1.8, 
Jesus says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and to the end of the earth. So God gave them witnessing power. We have witnessing power if we, if we want to express it and use it and power to overcome and power to produce spiritual fruit. In Romans 15, 13, <clears throat> now may the God of hope fill you with all joy <clears throat> and peace and there's, there's not a lot of joy floating around outside there you know people are not singing as they walk by and do their you know running and and their exercises and people are not at peace because uh you know society's gone crazy and in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the holy spirit so He's saying, fill you with joy, so you have strong joy, strong peace, and abound in hope, so you'll be full of hope. And if, if your focus is on what God is going to do after the white horses show up in the sky, it's like he's going to take strong control of all the problems. No one will be allowed to learn war anymore. Nobody will be allowed to build weapons of war anymore. There will be no such thing as nuclear bombs and nuclear missiles and nuclear weapons. They won't exist, which is, right? It's like, wait a minute, they exist today. Yeah, they do. But in those days, <coughs> nobody will have them. Nobody will have them. They won't be in submarines. There won't be a threat of everybody being blown to bits by a nuclear weapon. So <coughs> Jesus wants us filled with joy and peace daily and increasing our hope bank account. And, and I said it that way because um, <clears throat> everything God said, you can hope, will surely and certainly happen. And if he if he expresses something beautiful in the future, like Jesus says, um, rejoice in what I'm going to create, Jerusalem, a rejoicing. Jerusalem has been one sorry city for a long, long, long time. Right? And right now it's in terrible shape and it's going to get much worse the beast power is going to destroy jerusalem and destroy the the people of israel and then jesus is going to come back he's going to rebuild jerusalem he's going to first thing he does his feet touch the mount of olives splits the mount of olives puts in a huge river flowing down to the dead sea flowing out to the mediterranean full of fish all you fishermen you can be able to help teach people how to catch fish so they can have plenty of good food to eat. Okay, question, <clears throat> who does the filling? Does God do the filling, or does each person do the filling? All right? It'd be nice if God just did it. You woke up in the morning, and, and it was like, oh, now I'm full of joy. <laughs> I'm having a joy day today, right? The answer is both. Both have a part to play. Paul shows both parts in Colossians 1.9. We do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge, notice, filled with the knowledge. And that's where the huge problem we have on planet Earth today is two million people have a little bit of knowledge about Jesus Christ, but they don't know how to practice what Jesus says to practice, to do, what to be doing. So be filled with the knowledge, and we come on Sabbath, we look at the Ten Commandments on the wall, we, we do the, the festivals, the seven festivals throughout the year. All of these should be increasing our knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Okay, question, how do humans gain knowledge? Pretty much anybody could answer this. If this was a question on, your, on a test, how do humans gain knowledge? Well, they read and they study. Most people can Google things and they can read what... Mr. Google has to say, they can study books, they can, my son is really good at, <coughs> his car is um, getting close to 400,000 miles now, <laughs> it doesn't look so good, <laughs> but, but he keeps repairing it, last time I saw it, the two, the driver's handle and the handle behind the driver's handle have um, a zip tie through the plastic. So you can still operate the, those, two, those two doors by carefully pulling on the zip tie. And when something goes wrong with his car, he just goes to YouTube, 
finds the appropriate so somebody explaining how you do it and they say you buy this part and then you put this part in and then you do this and he just keeps doing it until he gets it right and then off he goes driving again he uh, he's quite frugal he doesn't like spending money so anyhow people they read they study they absorb different knowledge on different subjects and then they apply that knowledge now peter says believers are given god power for life eternal through learning god knowledge right so so what's what's the best kind of knowledge a human being can have how to have god give you eternal life what do you have to do to have god give you eternal life second peter 1 3 as his divine power has given us all things peter is Peter's saying you know the, the preaching has gone out the, the the writings have gone out all things have been given to that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him so knowing what jesus thinks knowing what jesus says knowing what the father's will is right gives us greater understanding of how the mind of god works um, okay how do people get filled with knowledge answer they go to school right we under we understand this if you want to be a nuclear physicist or a um, nu a nuclear scientist or rocket scientist or whatever you go to school in college and and they learn and they study and then they practice their knowledge and if they're good at it like um, a, a bomb technician you know that's that's one of those things you really want to learn your material really very well right because if they send you out to defuse a bomb and you haven't studied really really well it might be that's it let's get another none of the bomb technician because we just lost that one right god gives his servants a 24-hour knowledge learning period every seven days which is where we are now on the sabbath an opportunity to learn more of god and what he's thinking or what he's doing and how he's how he's guiding um you know the next few years you can tell you know from a study of daniel 11 you can tell where god is going to take america people a lot of people say america is not you can't find America in prophecy in the Bible. Well, I beg to differ. I can, I can show you exactly where it is. And, and it has to be America because it can't be anybody else. Right? There it is right there in the scriptures. So we study, we learn God's knowledge, and God's spirit helps our understanding based on the knowledge we keep learning and growing and expanding. 1 Corinthians 2.14 The things of the Spirit of God are spiritually discerned or spiritually understood we read and we study god's word and god's spirit provides the spiritual connectivity which is similar to being connected to the internet i, I woke up a couple of days ago oh we had we had some severe storms go through east texas and in the morning i had i had no internet and i couldn't make any telephone calls and i couldn't even send text messages so so uh it's like, what do I do now? <laughs> you know, quick, Relax. find a pigeon, find, find a pigeon and write some notes or something. Relax, that's a good point right there. So, um, 1 Corinthians 2.13, these things we also speak, which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. And most people, you know, they say, well, I can compare you know, a physical thing, this here, this here is a timer. I can compare the timer with certain buttons to push. When Rick was pushing the buttons for the music, apparently there's a button if you, you have to press the pause button or the, the machine just automatically rolls on and plays the next sim, the hymn for you. So, you know, that takes a little bit of knowledge and that takes a little bit of practice. Um, it's like, end of song, press the pause button, right? So, <clears throat> Passover, unleavened bread, and the 50 days of Pentecost are spiritual festivals. Now, when we do Passover, we see what we're doing. We see the three physical symbols, the, the bread, the wine, the foot washing. We see those, and that's the physical part of Passover, but it points to the spiritual parts. Unleavened bread, we see the unleavened bread that we're going to eat each day, right? And we, we might drive by us McDonald's and think, oh, I can't have a hamburger this week, right? 
and, and we compare physical and spiritual and we put things together like putting a puzzle together. The 50 days of Pentecost, which is the biggest festival, the most important festival, the most meaningful festival, and the one that we need to understand the most about is how does the Holy Spirit work? How do we connect into the Holy Spirit? How do we use the Holy Spirit to bear spiritual fruit? So, um, sadly, most Jesus people, and when I say Jesus people, it's, it's those who sing and praise about Jesus and read their Bibles, but most Jesus people learn no lessons from these three spiritual growth festivals. They're not doing Passover, right? Some are doing Seder, most are not doing anything. Um, some are doing Easter, which, which is not Passover. Easter is just a celebration of <coughs> um, He is risen. Right? The, if you want to boil Easter down, Sunday's you know, a sunrise service on Sunday morning before the sun comes up, it's, the whole point is you know, the sun rose, is rising, the sun is rising, the Son of God, Jesus, is risen, He is risen, celebrate, get a new dress, uh, go chase some Easter eggs, look out for the Easter bunny because you might trip over him or something, and, and celebrate that Jesus is alive again. Well, let's celebrate what Jesus is trying to teach us. That's, and he's trying to teach us to do Passover. So, um, and then he's trying to teach us to do unleavened bread in the days of Pentecost. So the Father and Jesus want people to learn how to use their godly powers. Right? Now, it's like you say, well, well, what power do I have? Well, if you think about it long enough, you have lots of powers. You have power how to operate your cell phone. You have power how to make a telephone call. Right? You have power how to drive your automobile. You have power to visit your neighbor and give your neighbor a ride. Or you know, there's, there's many powers we have. We have talking powers. We have learning powers. We have um, some may paint picture powers. There's, there's just many powers we have, and we just have to learn how to use those powers to benefit other people. Um, so apparently <clears throat> Stephen, Stephen in the Bible, was a really quick learner because in Acts 6 it tells us, verse 8, Stephen, full of faith and power. So the, the disciples had only just had the Feast of Pentecost. They'd only just had the baptism of 3,000 people. And shortly thereafter, Stephen is full of faith and full of power. And he did great wonders. Doesn't list all the wonders that he did, but it says he did great wonders. And he did signs among the people. And that's one of the reasons they chose him to be an organizer for distributing the food. So notice Stephen was not half full of power, right? Now, most of you have looked at your cell phones and seen the little icon that says half full, right? And, and sadly, sometimes you look at your cell phone and it says 1% battery left. <laughs> and then you go, uh oh, I'm, a, I'm about, I'm in trouble. My cell phone's about to quit working. So Stephen was fully connected to using God's power to serve God's people and was doing it and, you know, ended up being one of the first martyrs for the, for the, uh, for the Christian way. Paul shows that. He, God is eager to do his works through people, which means he wants us to use his powers to serve other people. Ephesians 3, verse 20. To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. And you, you might, you know, I might stop and ponder those words. God is able to do exceedingly, that's pretty big, abundantly, that's pretty big, according to the power that's working inside of us. So, you know, if we pray for somebody to be helped, you know, God, if God agrees and we're praying according to God's will, um, great important things can happen. And, and you know, but if we don't have the faith or if we doubt, then they're not going to happen. Jesus tells us that too. Paul explains that we need to work at being strong at using God's powers. Um, it, it's like if we don't feel strong we don't feel like doing much of anything 
right? But God says, I want you to grow in strength. Ephesians 6.10. Brethren, be strong, Paul writes to the Ephesian church members, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, it would have been great if the next verse says, you know, here's detailed explanation of how you can be strong and have power, <laughs> right? But you're supposed to be gleaning that from your understanding of God's thinking and what God wants. He wants us using his power. Paul points to three things that God is giving when he gives a person the earnest of his Holy Spirit, 2 Timothy 1.7. For <clears throat> God has not given us the spirit of fear. So if we're fearful, right, God has not given us the spirit of fear. God doesn't want us fearful. But instead, he's given us the spirit of power. And it's like, okay, Ian, what kind of power do you have? You know, I, I like to study the Greek. I, I, I learned so much when I started looking in at, at, a, at a Bible translation, and then I asked questions about it, and I say, okay, is this what Jesus said, or is this what the translator, translating it from Greek into English, thought he might have said? And there's, there's a great deal to be learned, as we'll see a little bit later. But of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. And, and you know, God wants us to love us, love him with all our heart and soul and mind to be. He's given us the power of love, right? So we need to exercise that power of love and of a sound mind, which is clear thinking, right? And <clears throat> day by day, we do dumb things we need to learn from our sound mind not to be doing dumb things anymore. Okay, question, how, how are spirit-led people different from regular people, right? Anybody want to give me an answer to that? How are spirit-led people different from regular people you see in Walmart? Is there any difference? Should have written it on the test, shouldn't I? Okay. There is a difference in that you understand where God is taking us. You understand us and that there's going to be a white horse day. On the day of trumpets, the white horses will be seen in the sky. The, the vast majority of the people alive today, when they see that, they won't have a clue what that is. Oh, it's aliens coming from Mars or something, right? Because, because nobody preaches... Right? We do on, on trumpets, we preach it almost every year, um, white horses in the sky. That, you know, <laughs> nobody's preaching that. You, you turn on your Sunday morning radio station and listen to come of the preachers, you're not going to hear the white horses are coming. Right? <laughs> so when they do come, it's going to be a huge surprise to people. So um, basically, you know, those who are spirit-led produce spirit fruit Whereas the average per is just, person is just producing human fruit. And Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Okay. Almost everybody you know loves something. You love ice cream. You love your dog. You love your wife, your husband. You love your children. Everybody knows how to love. Right? But he's saying spiritual love is at a higher level, a higher plane. Joy. You know, some people have joy, but, but you don't see it very often. A football, a football game in, uh, in the Super Bowl, the winning team's people in the stands, when, the, when they win the Super Bowl, that's joy. <laughs> My team won. Yay! They jump up and down and shout and, and do crazy things and whatever. All right? So, so people have these elements but God wants them to have the spiritual level of these elements, peace. Not too many people have peace. Most people are worried. They're worried about how much food costs at the, at the grocery store. Long suffering. Most people don't want to long suffer. And, and sadly, you know, road rage is where they're not going to suffer very much longer. They're just going to get their gun and go shoot somebody and they're doing it, right? Kindness, being kind to people. Um, you'll find kind people, right? Humanly kind people. God wants us being kind to people at a high spiritual level, and so on. Self-control. Now, there's a tough one, right? <laughs> because most people are having trouble with self-control. But by strong use of God's Holy Spirit powers, 
believers can excel in these and other life areas. Now take self-control as an example. Those who follow the words of God closely are strong in self-control. I'm not saying every area of self-control. I'm saying some areas. I'll give you an example. They're strong in self-control during unleavened bread. Each year, we get stronger and stronger at avoiding eating or having something leaven in our house, right? We, we, we remember last year, remember stories from years gone by where somebody put a cake right on the front doorstep and they assumed it was an unleavened bread cake given to them by somebody who was keeping unleavened bread, so they went inside and ate the cake. <laughs> and found out later it was a leavened cake. Um, so, so year by year we add to our knowledge base and we read, man, I spent a lot of time reading labels this year. I was keeping unleavened bread for maybe three months. It's like, I got a stack of crackers here. Now, <clears throat> do I have to eat all these crackers? And I read the label and what, what is this? Oh, that might, be, that might be leavening, that might be yeast or something. All right, I got to eat all those up. So, <clears throat> and uh, like I said, we, we get strong at self-control because we want to please God. Um, <clears throat> Another one is eating or not eating unclean meats and only eating clean meats, right? We, we learn pretty early when we come to the knowledge of the truth, God doesn't want us eating food that's bad for us. And there's, it's in scripture what's good food and what's bad food. And, and little by little we learn we're going to serve God by not eating the unclean meats and make, you know, be good and more healthy for us and it's pleasing to God, and that we have to self-control. Um, there was a time not too long ago, well, it was quite a while ago now, where, where a church leader stood up and said, you don't have to worry about unclean meats, you can eat anything you want. And immediately a, hand, you know, a bunch of people went to a catfish, catfish restaurant and, and ate catfish. And it's like, wait a minute, you studied and you learned from the Bible you can't eat catfish, it's unclean. And it's like, well, bad, but the minister in the church said we could do it, so we can do it, you know. So um, it's like, how, how much strong, strong, how strong was their self-control? Not very strong. They've kind of gotten weaker and weaker on their self-control there. So humans are focused and mindful, right? Why, why, why is it easier to be um, strong in self-control when it comes to food? Well, because... Humans are focused and mindful when it comes to putting food into their mouths, right? <clears throat> if, I, if I came, if you were sitting at a restaurant and I was the chef, and I came wheeling in and I said, oh, are you enjoying yourself? Yes, here's something, I just, I just cooked this up. This is delightful, this is wonderful. Here, eat some of this meat. And most of us would have the self-control to go, um, what kind of meat is it? <laughs> And the chef could say, it doesn't matter. I've made it say, taste so good. You can't, you can't turn this away. You've got to taste this. And we'd say, no, I need to know what kind of meat it is. <laughs> right? um, and when it comes to babies, they don't they're not have much self-control because they're, they're putting stuff in their mouths that is not meat, it's not food, it's dirt, it's rocks. <laughs> it's like, because how do they know? They don't know. It might taste good. Or it might, be, it might be good for their health. They've got to test it out. So the key is being mindful of God's true knowledge. Right? And, and that's, that's what God has been doing for thousands and thousands of years. That's what your Bible is all about. Be mindful of what God is wanting, what God is saying, what God is offering, what, you know, the benefits and the rewards that are coming if you do it according to the way God is teaching it. So, okay, now it's for... The audience test. All right, we're going to have a test here, so heads up, everybody. Um, please raise your hand if you have ever pressed the wrong button on your cell phone. Ah, good. I see quite a number of hands. All right, anybody want to explain which wrong button they were good at pressing? I hung up on Darlene. There you go, hanging up. I've, I've done that. I've done that a bunch of times. In fact, that was my answer. My answer was I'd be talking to somebody on the phone, happily talking away, and then the phone would ring in from somebody else. I guess that's call waiting, is it? Anyhow, 
I'd, it'd be ringing in my ear and I'd think, go away, go away, I'm, I'm talking on the phone, stop this, right? And then I'd look at the screen and the screen would say, do this or do this or do this. And it's like, I don't know which one I want to do. And I'd end up pressing A button and that would hang up on the first person and it wouldn't connect me to the second person. So I'd just, I'd just hang up the phone. But I learned, I learned that, you know, um, take, take a couple of seconds be, because both people are still going to be there, right? You've got enough time to take a breath. You've got enough time to read the screen. And sometimes the screen says, put the first caller on hold and answer the second caller, right? And then I think it says something like, reject the incoming call, right? And that's the one I want. Reject, I don't want to talk to you. Go to, go to voicemail. So we get good, strong results, right? So I have learned, it's like, and my phone won't ring right now because I've got it turned off. But, but if, if the phone rang, it's like it would take me a couple of seconds to find the mute button, right? Which is why it's turned off. Cause, so, yeah, cause, never hit the merge button when you talk to your girlfriend and your wife calls. Yeah, yeah. See, he's, see, he's, he's, he's studied. He's learned how to use his phone and how to stay out of trouble some of the time, but not all of the time. So <laughs> we get good, strong results when we have knowledge and we press the right buttons on our cell phones, right? We saw an example of that with the song leader today, right? You press the right button at the right time, you get the right results. Now, peace is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which I would say most of us have trouble with peace, right? Um, <clears throat> if you have pain, it's tough to be at peace. If you've got problems, it's tough to be at peace. If you've got loved ones who are suffering, it's tough to be at peace. If you look at the news, it's tough to be at peace. You know, you could go on and on and on and on and on because there are so many things, if you think about it more than a couple of seconds, you can't be peaceful. You can't be peaceful about it because it's gone, stuff has gone haywire. Now, the New Testament writers, they spoke about peace extremely oh, uh, frequently. In, in Paul's case, Romans 1, 7, he said to all who are in Rome, in, you know, grace and peace from our God, our Father. To those in Corinth, Corinth, Paul wrote, grace to you and peace from God, our Father. To the Galatian church, he wrote, grace to you and peace from God, our Father. In the Ephesian church, he wrote, grace to you and peace from God, our Father. It's like, well, Paul, didn't you have any other way of getting started? It's like, no. Peace is what those people needed to think about because you know, there was a lot of persecution in those days for, for those believing in Christ. 1 Peter, grace and peace be multiplied. 2 Peter, grace and peace be multiplied to you. In, in John, 2 John 1, 3, grace, mercy and peace be with you um, from God the Father. So, so notice most of them are pointing to God the Father Right? And most religious worship points to who? Jesus, who is the Son of God the Father, right? And He's our Savior and He's our Redeemer. And, and we should praise and sing to God and to Jesus as well. But Jesus said, leaving the planet, He said, from now on, you won't be asking me stuff. You will be calling God. You will dial, you know, dial God on speed dial and say, God, I want to talk to you, Father, God the Father. Right? And then Jesus said, well, I'll be there with him and we'll work it out and we'll send you some answers. So their 21st century, I'm sorry, their first century, their first century readers suffered a lot of persecution and they wanted their readers to focus on the spirit fruit of peace. Right? And, and, and I, might, I might add that the regular people without God's Holy Spirit, um, they don't have any peace, do they? Do they have... I mean, if you work really hard at it, um, now, now, my wife was good at this. She'd come home from a long day and she'd get in um, the bathtub and she'd light candles and she'd get her favorite book and she'd stay in the tub for like an hour reading her favorite book and smelling candles. So, you know, she, she said, I am go I'm going to have peace, right? Because when you're with pregnant women delivering babies, you don't have a lot of peace. So for a person to grow strong at piano playing, 
We all know what they have to do. It's common knowledge, right? They have to frequently press the right keys using piano knowledge. Now, I can press all the keys on the piano board, but I don't have the knowledge of what's going to happen when I press that one, or what's going to happen when I press this one, or how long, you know, how will it sound if I press three of these together? You have to have piano knowledge, and you have to learn to practice pressing the right ones in the right order to get the right kind of tune. So for us to have greater peace, we need to read verses describing godly peace. You know, God, God has peace. <laughs> there is, there is, you know, God's at peace. God's a very peaceful being because he knows everything and he knows how everything is going to work out and he knows it's all going to be great once we get past some of the hurdles. Right? So describing godly peace and then ask God for help in activating his peace in our mind. And, and sometimes I think, you know, the best opportunity for that is read slowly through some of God's scriptures, Psalms, read, read David in the Psalms, and, and just thanksgiving. If we were talking about the subject of thanksgiving, David is just tremendous at thanksgiving. It's thank you for this. Thank you if I didn't twist my ankle. I got climbing this mountain. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. You know, he, David was really good at being thankful. So Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. And that is all better translated. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Right? Because every day is different and you have different situations. So if we want to grow stronger, we have to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. The more we practice using God's powers in this lifetime, the more capable we will be at using God's massive power in the next life. Right? Right now, if somebody aggravates us in this life, we're tempted to use the power of the fist you know, punch their lights out, hit them in the face, and knock them down, whatever. Um, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> Not that I did it very well in the beginning. But um, So uh, in the next life, we're going to have massive powers at our, hand, our fingertips, and God wants us to be peaceful, merciful, gentle with other human beings. And, and you might ponder this. Is it, is it a gentle punishment for the Egyptian people to have no rain for a year, is that a gentle punishment? Well, uh, maybe, right? You can think of a lot more severe punishment, right? You could say, well, we'll just come in and we'll, we'll kill every one in 10, right? And then next month we'll come back and we'll do it again. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of severe punishment, but God wants us to be in tune with God's thinking, use his massive powers that we're going to have be connected to in the next life God told Joel about his excitement over giving the Holy Spirit in Joel 2.29 on my servants, my men servants on my main servants I will pour out my spirit God's excited about doing this <coughs> He told Joel about it it's in the early, back in the Old Testament verse 30 I will show wonders in heaven and on the earth and the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood all these things before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. So the two witnesses are coming. Once we start the tribulation period, which isn't all that far away, believe it or not, when the two witnesses start preaching, they're going to have a great deal of spiritual understanding that I, I don't think we have now. And so we need to tune into what they have to say because God is make sure, going to make sure that they are preaching this gospel, pure truth, you know, day in and day out for three and a half years, and, and we should all be very much in agreement with the two witnesses because they're speaking like the mouth of God. Now, Peter said this on the greatest day of Pentecost in Acts 2.16, said, this is what was spoken by Daniel, by the prophet Joel. Remember, Joel is where God told him excited that he'd be pouring out his spirit. In verse 17, it shall come to pass, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Right? Um, I'm not sure about the word all there. We might check that one in the Greek. But, but it's going to be available to all flesh. And I believe that. I believe 
everybody and anybody can tap into God's spirit if they're prepared, prepared to learn and follow his instructions. God has been pouring out his Holy Spirit for 2,000 years now. We've had true, faithful Christians live, die, go to the grave, waiting in the grave to be resurrected at the first resurrection. For 2,000 years that's been happening so that his servants could bear much spiritual fruit. Obviously, the apostles did bear much fruit. Many, many others have throughout the years. God's servants are connecting to God's spirit energy. Right? Now, we have energy drinks. You can go to Walmart or the grocery store and up the sign will say, energy drinks. And it's like, oh yeah, I am tired of shopping. I need an energy drink, right? That's right? But God's spirit gives energy and drawing on his powers to help us overcome things. God is excited about future kings and priests helping new humans in the world tomorrow. That's going to be, that's like having, you know, many, many young children be born in your family and you helping them all to be really good at this, that, or the other thing, right? Um, Acts 1.4, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. The Father is excited. He's promising the pouring out of the Spirit and he did it, and he wants to keep doing it. He wants to do it for anybody who's interested. Verse 5, you shall be baptized, meaning engulfed with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Power to think clearly. Most people can't think clearly. Most people don't know God. They don't know what God is doing. They don't know you know, why God did certain things. They don't know why Jesus had to come and die. They, there's a whole lot of things. They don't know what Jesus expects of them. God wants his future kings to be well practiced at using his spirit power. Right? And most of us, most of us, maybe I shouldn't include myself in that, but many of you, right, are well practiced at using your cell phones. You you can find stuff in your cell phone that I can't even dream about. It's like I am, I am a slow learner. Anyhow, we're well practiced at certain things and God wants us to be well practiced at using his Holy Spirit power. Jesus helped John to spell out how believers will be using God's powers in their fleshly lives. In 1 John 3, 7, notice this is the New King James. Little children, let no one deceive you he who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Now notice what happens in the very next verse. 1 John 3, 8, New King James Bible. He who sins is of the devil. Right? And if you notice in the handout, the word practices is followed by 4160. That's the number in Strong's listing. And in verse 8, he who sins has that same word, 4160. How come the New King James people didn't use practice again in verse 8? Right? And now look what they've done with the verse. He who sins is of the devil. Well, what does that mean? That means everybody sins, therefore everybody is of the devil. It makes no sense. Right? <clears throat> the problem is, people read through the Bible and they come to a verse that makes no sense. What are, they, what are their brains going to do? It's like, I don't know. I don't know what to make about that. I don't even want to think about that. that that's a nonsensical verse. Oh, well, let's read the next verse. Maybe there's a better verse coming up, right? Now, notice in the handout I put the NASB, the New American Standard Bible who rightly, just as John is in the New King James in verse 7, in verse 8 it says, the one who practices sin is of the devil. Okay, didn't that, that clear it up, didn't it? <clears throat> didn't that make that verse so much more understandable? If you daily, weekly, monthly practice sin, you're in the devil's campground, you're on his team. Now, if John 1 John 3, 8 <clears throat> was a good translation, then everybody would be of the devil, like I said, right? And there'd be no Jesus people, and then <laughs> that makes no sense. And then now your Bible is just confusing you worse and worse. 
Right? Okay. John 1, John 3, 9. Whoever is born of God does not sin. Okay. <clears throat> well, born can also be translated begotten. Right? But in any case, it still doesn't work. But notice the word, the 4160 is still in the text, in the Greek. But you don't see the word practice there. In the NAS, NASB, they put in, right, which makes a whole lot more sense, no one who is born or begotten of God practices sin. So that's, that's the whole point of Christianity, stop practicing sin. So <clears throat> finally in John 3.10, New King James translators swing back to spiritual clarity. So sometimes they're clear by putting in the word practice, and sometimes they make a mess of it by not using the word practice. Right? So the New American Standard Bible is very good. I like it a lot. Once I, once, once I found out about it and I got a copy and I started using it, it's a very good set of translations. But it still doesn't do this section justice, if you happen to be reading it in your NASB, right? <laughs> but the Fred Coulter Bible is even better than the NASB. Now, to show you what I mean, I'm going to quickly read six verses listed in your handout from the Fred Coulter Bible to show you how Fred went, you know, looked at the Greek, looked at the understanding, used God's Holy Spirit, so, verse 4, <clears throat> Everyone who practices sin is also practicing lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. Very clear, very understandable. Verse 6, Every, Everyone who dwells in him does not practice sin. Everyone who practices sin has not seen him, nor has known him. Makes a lot of clear sense. Verse 7, Little children, do not allow anyone to deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous verse 8 the one who practices sin is of the devil bingo clear as a bell because the devil has been sinning from the beginning verse 9 everyone who has been begotten by god does not practice sin i mean how how more clear could it be right but but most people are really reading old king james bibles or new king james bibles and they, if, they, if they're careful and they're focused on these words, they're getting confused like crazy, like anyone who sins is of the devil. No, that's not true. Right? Verse 10. By this standard, right, uh, everyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. So, so it's like the Fred Calder Bible is streets ahead of all these other Bibles, the NASB, Right? It's a pretty good Bible, and you can, buy, you can get it. You can get it in the bookstores. You can find it pretty easily. So, but it's well ahead of the, the New King James. So in a nutshell, God is saying to those, <coughs> to those who do not practice righteousness, he's saying that those not practicing righteousness are not of God. It's, that's pretty simple and pretty clear. You've got to learn how to practice righteousness. And that's why you get the Holy Spirit, of, the, the power of the Holy Spirit given to us, to learn what practicing righteousness is, and then to have the power to practice righteousness. Classic example, <coughs> don't, eat, don't eat leavened bread for seven days during the days of unleavened bread, right? And most of us are very strong at practicing Holy Spirit at not eating leavened bread during unleavened bread, because we do it year after year after year after year. We practice it, we practice it, and we get pretty good at it. Right? <coughs> Jesus speaks loudly in the book of Revelation when he urges his followers to be overcomers. In Revelation 2 7, he says, um, <coughs> To him who overcomes, I'll give to eat of the tree of life. In 2 11, see what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. <coughs> Most people don't study the second death in the Bible, they don't know what it means. <coughs> Verse 17 of chapter 2. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes, I will give some of, some of the hidden manna to eat, right? Which would, is worthy of a lot more study, but it's, it's obviously going to be a good thing. Verse 26, power over the nations. Revelation 3, 5. <clears throat> He'll be clothed in white garment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. Most people don't know anything about it. <coughs> 
you know, who does God want to blot out of the book of life? And the answer is given in Exodus, those who sin against God will be blotted out of the book of life. Verse 21, he who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father. And then in verse 7 of Revelation 21, he who overcomes will inherit all things and I will, I will be his God and he will be my son. So that's, that's everything. That's peace, that's joy, that's love. That's, that's all summed up in that one verse. So in one sense, the Apostle Paul is writing this next section to us in this congregation. In Colossians 1.9, he says, We do not cease to pray that and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. So a major point of what I'm saying is learn as much knowledge about what God is teaching and don't ignore knowledge or don't turn away from his knowledge, right? In all wisdom and in spiritual understanding, a lot of the knowledge can only be fully understood through spiritual understanding, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and all the fruits of the Spirit and all other good works, increasing in the knowledge of God. That's why he has us come to schoolhouse, Sabbath, Sabbath meeting. We are to be increasing. That's why he has us do the seven annual festivals each year. Each year we should know more about trumpets. We should know more about atonement. We should know more about each festival each year because we're adding new knowledge, hopefully, on top of the old knowledge, and now we understand it more fully. Verse 11, strengthened with all might, which is, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, still, I, I still like watching Superman movies, right? It's like, here's a guy who has all the power and the wisdom and the knowledge, and he's the savior of the world, his only problem is with kryptonite, and if you can just keep the kryptonite away from him, he's great, right? Um, and, and Paul is saying, strengthened with all might, that reminds me of Superman, according to his glorious power, for all patience, which can be translated cheerful endurance, right? And, and you know, most patience isn't necessarily cheerful, right? Most endurance isn't necessarily cheerful, but the intent of the Greek there is cheerful endurance, knowing that God is planning for the, for the future, your future and for the future of the world, and long-suffering with joy, which most long-suffering does not generate its own joy, right? We've had power outages all over East Texas recently, and, and the people with the Generac, and I'm, this is not a commercial, right? The people with the Generac uh, generators um, they automatically come on. <coughs> and so you, you, in a blink of an eye, the power goes out, and in the blink of an eye, your generator comes on, and life goes on just the way you like it. Except I went to the grocery store the other day, and uh, they, they've got freezers full of frozen food, right? And I went there, and all the rest of the city, a little town of Hawkins, they had no electricity. But I went into the grocery store, the lights were on, everything was humming along, people were buying groceries. And I said to the grocery lady, I said, it must be nice to have uh, your own generating system. She said, yeah, but it went out. <laughs> I said, what? She said, the generators didn't come on and we had to hire people to come and put in a new generator to save all that frozen food in the frozen store. You know, it's, so it's like, <coughs> Sometimes generators work <coughs> just the way they're supposed to, and sometimes they don't. But Paul is saying, strengthen with all might, or according to his glorious power, right, Holy Spirit power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy. So God wants us daily connecting through reading his word, studying his word, understanding his word, connecting to his Holy Spirit power source, thinking of it as power, knowing the power is there available, right? Now, you know, if I turn my cell phone on, you could all teach me how to contact, you know, websites or to contact YouTubes, uh, videos, or you know, how to find good knowledge about food preparation, about 
fixing your automobile, changing a tire, right? There is knowledge available, right? But I don't know which buttons to push. I do in a few cases, but not in most cases, right? So it's, it's seeking the knowledge and then learning how to practice the knowledge, push the right buttons, right? And bear much Holy Spirit fruit for God. So this is how we prepare to be future kings and priests to rule over the nations in the next life.